Michelle sat in the kitchen as the pre-dawn twilight mingled with the warm light from the night lamp. She waited for a truck to transport her belongings from the apartment she had rented for nearly eight years. Michelle arrived at this apartment as a naive and inexperienced young woman, fresh out of school and just starting college. Back then she felt like a child, and now Michelle was a different person, an adult, knowledgeable about life, carrying the weight of experience. She was even a bit envious of her younger, more enthusiastic self, who believed the best and most exciting experiences were still to come. Initially, it was like that. Life in the city swept Michelle into a whirlwind of studies, new acquaintances, and unfamiliar entertainment. It was fun. Then a series of troubles fell on her, forcing her to grow up quickly, shed her rose-tinted glasses, and fight. Michelle was born and raised in the village, over a hundred kilometres away from the bustling city. Her parents had been childless for many years and had tried everything. They travelled to holy sites, visited healing springs, and sought help from various herbalists. This was after official medicine declared Michelle's mother infertile. Doctors didn't give her any chance of becoming pregnant and advised her to either accept the situation or adopt a child. Only then did the couple decide to explore unconventional methods. Eventually, a miracle occurred. However, by the time Michelle was born, her parents were already over 40. While their peers were becoming grandparents, they were just starting to raise a child. The girl's childhood was idyllic, loving parents, a crowd of friends and a loyal dog. Summers were filled with bike rides to the river and walks in the forest. In winter, the same group of friends enjoyed sledding down hills and building massive snow fortresses. Michelle's parents doted on her, finding delight and amazement in all she did. She grew up feeling secure, enveloped in love and acceptance. As she grew older, Michelle did notice that her friend's parents were younger and more physically fit, but this never bothered her. In fact, she used to feel sorry for her peers when she saw how their parents treated them, shouting, showing irritation, and sometimes even resorting to physical punishment. Michelle's family was different. Her parents respected her wishes and were very attentive. Home was a place of unwavering support for Michelle. Study to become a white collar, her mother advised. You'll work in a comfortable office, unlike me, who used to work on the farm from dawn to dusk. Physical labour quickly wears out a woman's beauty. Listen to your mother, the father chimed in. You're smart, you can handle anything. The father and mother often set their neighbour's son, Brian, as an example for Michelle. The boy was short, sturdy and had a pleasant disposition, though he was not conventionally handsome, like the most handsome boy from their school. Brian was different from the other village children. Instead of playing soccer, he spent his time reading books from the local library. Michelle found it strange that Brian preferred anatomy books and treaties on the human body over adventure novels or comic books. She had trouble understanding the titles of these textbooks, let alone their content. But nobody was surprised when Brian, after finishing school, entered the medical academy in the capital. Brian's parents were proud to share their son's success with the neighbours. Being a student, he already assisted a famous surgeon and was working on an important and complicated research project. Michelle felt both happiness and sadness. Brian had soared so high that she couldn't reach him. The truth was that she was always fond of him, but she never confessed her feelings. First of all, she was, for him, just a little girl. And secondly, she didn't want to hang herself on the guy's neck. Michelle wasn't like that. What attracted Michelle to Brian? His kind, intelligent eyes, his calm demeanour, and his inner strength and confidence. Brian always seemed to know what to do in any situation. And he was different from the other boys. He paid little attention to girls, focusing solely on his academics. Occasionally, he and Michelle would chat. Living nearby, they often returned from school or the store together, discussing everything from the weather and village events to broader topics like world issues and ecology. Michelle didn't have such interesting conversations with anyone else. She always wished she could chat with Brian a bit longer at the gate, but he was always rushing to get back to his books. Of course, Brian was not only popular with Michelle, the other girls were also attracted to him. 
They behaved more boldly and freely than the modest Michelle, but their attempts to get Brian's attention were futile too. Michelle rejoiced quietly at their failures and took pleasure in their disappointment. When Brian entered the capital's academy and left the village, Michelle realised that she would never see him again. Their friendly chats and engaging conversations had ended, and it was a sad reality which was out of her hands. Years passed, and Michelle finally graduated too. The joy of receiving her diploma was marred by her father's hospitalisation due to a heart attack the day before. As teachers spoke warmly about Michelle at the graduation ceremony, her father was battling for his life in intensive care. Michelle and her mother, worried about their loved one, could hardly enjoy the festivities. Of course, Michelle had envisioned this day differently. She had worked tirelessly, studying hard to make her parents proud at her graduation. For the first time, she regretted that her parents were quite old. Previously, she had appreciated their advanced age, as they were more tolerant towards her than younger parents might be. However, her father's situation served as a stark reminder that older parents may have health problems and something bad could happen at any moment. Her father had spent all of June and half of July in a coma. He was not aware that his daughter had been accepted into college. In midsummer, he passed away in the hospital without regaining consciousness. His passing was a significant blow to both Michelle and her mother. But life went on, and soon after the funeral, the girl and her mother selected an apartment in the city where Michelle would reside during her studies. It was a tiny apartment in an old five-story building, conveniently located nearby of the college. Michelle was excited to start this new chapter in her life. It was both exciting and interesting, and it also helped her cope with the loss of her father. The new experiences were a needed distraction. Settling into city life, Michelle began to regain the zest for life. She made new friends, and even started dating a fellow student named Larry. They enjoyed each other's company, going to cafes, and taking walks along the embankment. Their relationship was light and superficial, and they both understood this. Neither of them harboured strong feelings for the other, but they were content with their arrangement. It was common to date casually, and they were satisfied with their easy-going relationship. Michelle and Darcy became friends during their studies. Although they studied in different departments, they shared some lectures. They first met when Darcy forgot her fountain pen, and Michelle lent her a spare. Darcy lived with her overbearing parents in the city, and often stayed overnight at Michelle's place to escape their control. I envy you. You live alone. No one gets on your nerves. Darcy would often sigh. In response, Michelle would simply shake her head. She didn't argue with Darcy, knowing she wouldn't understand. Michelle envied Darcy too, for she had both her parents. To Michelle, Darcy's parents were not evil. They simply loved their daughter and cared about her future. The bitterness of her father's loss often came back to her, sometimes quite painfully. Besides, her mother also caused anxiety. She frequently had headaches and high blood pressure. Despite her mother's attempts to hide all this, Michelle could see through their video calls that she was unwell. In the end, in her third year, Michelle suffered another loss. Her mother passed away from a stroke. The incident occurred in front of their neighbour, who called an ambulance, but it was too late. The neighbours in the village helped organise the funeral and memorial services. Michelle was immensely grateful for their support. But her new friends, Larry and Darcy, were not as supportive. Larry evaporated, unable to withstand the devastation that the tragedy had caused in Michelle. Darcy tried to distract Michelle, but her words and actions were so ineffective that they only made Michelle feel worse. Eventually, Darcy too left Michelle, although not permanently. It's probably best for you to be alone right now. Well, you can call me if you need anything, when you come to your senses. It was a challenging period. Michelle had to rebuild herself and rise from the ashes. Adapting to total loneliness was not easy. For a long time, she yearned to call her mother to share news or discuss problems. However, gradually, 
Michelle returned to normal life. With graduation looming, Michelle's acquaintances, including Darcy, were making various plans for their post-graduation lives. Some dreamed of travelling, others considered further studies. But Michelle had only one option, to find a job. Adulthood and responsibility were daunting, but she had to survive. Despite her qualifications, Michelle couldn't find a job in her field. Who would hire a lawyer with no experience? Her 22-year-old age and gender worked against her. You're young, you'll get married, then go on maternity leave, then perhaps a second one, followed by an endless cycle of sick leaves. We know your type. A human resources manager said to her once. While other employees weren't as outspoken, Michelle could read their reluctance in their expressions. No one wanted to hire, train, and then pay maternity and sick leave for a young, inexperienced girl. Despite her assurances that she didn't plan to marry or have children soon, no one was convinced. As a result, the girl decided to work as a cashier, temporarily, until she found a job in her speciality, because she needed to pay for housing and food, and there was nowhere to get money. At that time, her routine included early rising, a crowded bus ride across the city, and long, exhausting monotonous work. She had to be extremely attentive to avoid any shortages being deducted from her salary. However, the most challenging aspect was dealing with people. Despite enduring rudeness, outright insults, and accusations of underperformance from customers, Michelle had to remain impeccably polite. Darcy couldn't understand why Michelle put up with it all. If I were you, I'd have left this damn job a long time ago, Darcy said. The two were friends again, primarily because Darcy had fallen out with her parents and needed a place to stay. Darcy worked as an accountant in a firm where her father had secured her a job. With her parents' support, Darcy led a life of relative ease, which made it hard for her to understand Michelle's struggles. Michelle yearned for a strong, reliable, wise and faithful man to share her burdens, but finding such a man seemed hard. But to her great surprise, Darcy managed to find a decent man at work. Art was the head of a department, and he constantly took Darcy on dates to restaurants, complimented her, gave her expensive gifts, and eventually proposed. Michelle was genuinely happy for her friend. However, she felt her own loneliness and worthlessness more acutely against this backdrop. Michelle attended Darcy's wedding. The groom's friends were interested in the attractive bridesmaid, but they all had partners, leaving Michelle alone as usual. One of Art's friends caught Michelle in a narrow corridor, pressed her against him, and whispered an obscene suggestion to become his mistress, promising material wealth. Michelle pushed him away, her mood completely soured. Of course, in searching her soulmate, Michelle also tried online dating. She stated in her profile that she was only interested in serious, long-term relationships with the potential for marriage. This probably deterred some unsuitable candidates, but unfortunately not all. Michelle had a series of unsuccessful dates. She could probably write an interesting book, or at least a lengthy article, about them. You must have been acting a bit wrong, Darcy said thoughtfully to Michelle. There's no such thing as everyone being a jerk. It just doesn't happen. Michelle was hurt by Darcy's words. She had hoped for support and understanding, but Darcy had implied that she was to blame for her problems, not the men. Michelle wondered if Darcy was right. After all, she seemed to have it all. She was working in her chosen profession, was married, had her own home, and was expecting a baby. But despite Darcy's harsh words, Michelle was happy for her friend's success and desperately hoped that one day she would also be lucky. However, at the moment, her life was chaotic, filled with loneliness, financial struggles, and a monotonous job. When Darcy had her baby, the friends started seeing each other more frequently. Darcy, now a tired young mother, was struggling to cope with the baby and her unhelpful husband. She was also upset with her parents, who had promised to help with the baby, but were nowhere to be found after the birth. They themselves asked for grandchildren. Both my parents and my mother-in-law promised to help, but as soon as I gave birth, they disappeared. 
I'm struggling all alone with the baby. I'm not eating enough. I'm not sleeping enough. The baby is so cranky. I can't take it any more. Michelle initially began helping Darcy with the baby once a week, and her friend appreciated her visits. Darcy would make tea, offer treats, and take a bath while Michelle cared for the baby. However, with time, Darcy started calling Michelle more frequently for help due to various reasons, such as needing to go to the dentist or the stores. Michelle, despite being tired from her own work and household chores, always put aside her tasks to help her friend. After all, Darcy was the only close friend Michelle had, and she didn't want to lose her. And anyway, friends are supposed to help each other out. That's what friendship is, Michelle thought. But she always felt awkward in the presence of Darcy's husband. Yuri seemed dissatisfied with his wife and the frequent presence of her friend in their apartment. Occasionally, they would argue in front of Michelle, leaving her feeling embarrassed. Yuri and Darcy would accuse each other of being lazy and lacking support. Before the birth of their baby, Michelle thought their family was perfect. Perhaps it was just an illusion. And then a real problem happened in Michelle's life. During a cash register audit at the supermarket, a significant shortage was discovered. Michelle was accused of stealing that money. Upon hearing that accusation, she was stunned and felt nauseous. She didn't have that kind of money, and she would have to work for six months for free to pay it all back, and not to eat, not to drink, not to pay the rent. So how can this be? Michelle tried to defend herself to her boss. It must be a mistake. I couldn't have let this happen. I'm careful with my work. I've been working for you for a long time, and nothing like this has ever happened. Well, it's happened now. The supervisor looked at Michelle accusingly, creating a distance between them. She was usually friendlier to her as a long-time employee. What do we do now? What do you mean, what? Pay off the shortfall, otherwise you're facing a criminal case for embezzlement or theft. I'm not sure how they classify it now. Either way, you're in big trouble. But I don't have that kind of money. Maybe I can pay it back gradually. I could give you half of my salary until it's paid off. The boss shook her head. The money must be in the cashier's office soon. The whole sum. No instalments. But where will I get that amount of money? I don't know. Borrow from someone or take out a loan. At this moment, her phone beeped insistently in her jeans pocket, displaying Darcy's name on the screen. Hi, need babysitting again. She needs babysitting again, Michelle guessed, and suddenly a thought struck her. Of course, Darcy. She has often boasted about having a financial cushion for her maternity leave. She will surely help me out, and I will try to pay her back as soon as possible. That's the solution. Michelle! Darcy's tired voice sounded over the phone, a baby's demanding cry in the background. Michelle, I need to go out for a couple of hours this evening. Can you come over after work to babysit my son? I will. Thank you. You're the best friend I've ever had. Michelle was confident that Darcy would assist her in her problem, especially as she had the means to do so. That's the situation, Michelle said after sharing all the story. I'm in a tough spot, and you're the only one who can help me. It was uncomfortable for Michelle to ask, but she felt she had no other choice. Yet upon hearing her request, Darcy tensed up and fidgeted in her chair. Michelle, I'm sorry, but I can't help you, Darcy replied finally. Why not? Michelle couldn't believe. Why? Darcy began sounding annoyed. First, Art and I have a mortgage. His job isn't always stable, so we're slowly using my savings. Plus, we have a baby. Diapers, formula. You don't realise how expensive it all is. I understand, Michelle nodded, her last hope for a solution fading. Darcy couldn't help her, and it was terribly disappointing. Can you still babysit, despite my refusal? Darcy asked, looking down. Of course. How could you ever think otherwise? We're friends, Michelle assured her. 
In the end, Michelle had to take out a loan. Her already frugal lifestyle became even more stringent. She took on another part-time job, worked day and night, and spent her spare time caring for Darcy's child. Meanwhile, Darcy acquired a new car straight from the showroom. With great delight, she described its merits to Michelle, who listened, nodded and smiled, all the while trying not to think about how Darcy had explained just weeks before that she couldn't help her because her savings had almost depleted and she and Art were struggling. It turned out that Darcy could have lent her friend money, but she didn't do it. Michelle understood that Darcy should not have to sacrifice her dream of a new car for her sake. After all, how Darcy spent her money was her business. She owed Michelle nothing, so there was no reason for Michelle to take offence. And Michelle wasn't offended. She still visited Darcy in her spare time to help with the baby, making sure her friend knew she wasn't alone. The summer and beautiful golden autumn flew by quickly, and cold weather arrived. It was then that Michelle realised she had nothing to wear. Her old jacket was in disrepair, stained with a mark that refused to wash out. She urgently needed new clothes, but how could she afford them? All of Michelle's salary went towards rent and loan payments. She survived on bread, cheap pasta and canned food. Nevertheless, she needed to wear something. Darcy suggested, Go to the flea market. What? asked Michelle, not understanding. Well, there's one near the station, where the old fountain used to be, remember? People gather there to sell used items. I'm sure you'll find something. The next weekend, Michelle decided to visit that flea market. Initially, she was put off by the name, assuming the items would be dirty and untidy. However, she was pleasantly surprised. The market was filled with tall stores, similar to a regular market, and the items were quite decent. Dishes, clothes, toys and antiques. Michelle felt as if she was walking through a museum. There were old plastic puppets, books in shabby bindings, and even a gramophone, a true rarity. Michelle's main interest was outerwear. She eventually found the right row, filled with bright short jackets, quality down jackets, and even fur coats. A beautiful, soft blue coat immediately caught Michelle's eye. It was elegant, stylish, and appeared to be in like-new condition, with no scuffs, stains, or holes. Plus, it seemed to be the right size. The seller turned out to be a woman in her fifties. "'You seem to like the coat,' she smiled. "'Try it on. I think it will fit you. I can tell it's your style, and I've got an eye for these things.' Michelle tried on the coat and found the saleswoman was right. It suited her figure. She even admired herself in the mirror. When the saleswoman stated the price, Michelle was astonished. It was inexpensive, she could easily afford the beautiful coat, and couldn't believe her luck. Eventually, Michelle left the flea market in the sky-blue coat. The weather had turned cold, and she didn't want to wear her old thin jacket after trying on the elegant coat. Dressed in the beautiful clothes, Michelle felt more confident, relaxed and happy. It seemed like a small thing, but it greatly affected her mood. She felt as if everyone was looking at her admiringly. And perhaps they were. A pretty girl with a slight smile on her lips, wearing a beautiful coat, would certainly attract attention. Michelle decided to exit the bus early and walk to her house, planning to buy something tasty from the store on the way. It's okay to treat yourself once in a while. As Michelle was hurrying to the grocery store, she heard someone's voice. Slowly, Michelle turned around and saw a gypsy girl on the deserted sidewalk. She was tall, swarthy, with a white-toothed smile. She wore a shawl from under which a long black braid, adorned with beads and thin ribbons, peeked out. A short jacket, a floor-length skirt, and bulky sneakers completed her look. Let me guess your future, pretty one. Probably she's a bad fortune teller, if she can't see that her potential client has no money at all, thought Michelle. I'll just do fortune-telling, the girl suddenly said, examining Michelle with her black eyes. Free fortune-telling. I'm just learning. I need to practice. Michelle grinned, suspecting the girl was a young con artist. I see you don't trust me, the gypsy girl clucked her tongue. Well, well, 
Then I'll tell you a bit about your past. Then you'll realize that I'm not deceiving you. Well, I'm listening. Michelle relaxed for some reason. The girl was so sweet, so friendly that she completely put her at ease. I see that life isn't easy for you. I see loneliness, past losses. Oh, they were very close to you. Your parents, probably. Yes. The fortune teller looked sympathetically at Michelle, who nodded affirmatively. Surprisingly, the girl accurately read her past. But you didn't give up. You didn't break. You're strong, continued the young gypsy, and you won't break. You're alone now, and it's hard. Just know that your life will soon change. It's already starting to change. You just don't see it yet. Really? Michelle looked hopefully at the gypsy. Of course. I see that you'll have money soon. Lots of money. You'll forget about poverty once and for all. You'll have luck soon. I wish I had. Smiled Michelle. I like your prediction. I wish it would happen soon. It will be soon. Replied the young gypsy seriously. I see that you're skeptical, but want to believe. You'll remember my words. However, it's not money that will bring you happiness. It's something else. Later, a little later, you'll meet your man. He's already searching for you. He'll find you soon. You'll be happy. Oh, I see babies. Shall I tell you how many you'll have? No, I'd rather leave it as a surprise. Michelle was warmed by the novice fortune teller's prophecies, and tears began to gather in her eyes. Perhaps she simply confused Michelle's dreams with her future. That was all. No, I'm not mistaken to that extent," protested the gypsy. Michelle shuddered with surprise. Has she read my mind? She wondered, feeling goosebumps crawl down her back. And when? When will all this happiness suddenly befall me? She asked. I'll give you a hint, even though it's a bit intrusive. You'll figure it out eventually. It's all about your new coat. Examine it at home. Be cautious, the gypsy suggested. Wow, Michelle smiled. And what should I look for? You'll find out, the gypsy woman replied evasively. I've told you too much already. Everything's going to be fine. Don't be afraid, and believe in the good. All right. Thank you. The gypsy girl waved goodbye and hurried away. Michelle watched her until she disappeared behind the trees. She didn't believe in the fortune teller's prediction, but nevertheless, she examined her coat when she got home. She searched the pockets, scrutinized the collar, and probed the lining. Suddenly, she felt a rustling piece of paper. Could it be a large bill? The gypsy did promise money. Michelle thought. What if the old coat's previous owner hid something valuable in it? Carefully, she ripped open the lining and reached inside, pulling out not a large bill as she had hoped, but a piece of paper. The quick scrawling handwriting on the scrap of paper took her by surprise. It seemed like a treasure hunt guide. The gypsy had promised wealth, however, the contents of the note shocked Michelle. Please help. Read the young woman. This is not a joke or an evil prank. I've been kidnapped. I'm locked up in a basement, forced to repair old items which I believe he sells. I'm in a village not far from the city. I don't know the name, but I saw a sign that says 153 kilometers. The house is on the outskirts of the village. It's always quiet here. No one lives nearby. Immediately behind the house is a forest or a garden. I can't identify it. I fear he'll kill me, like he did the others. Please save me. Michelle's breath hitched, her hands shook, and her temples throbbed. The person who wrote this was in danger, gripped by a fear she couldn't fathom. What should she do? Michelle had no doubt the note was a genuine plea for help. She made the only decision she thought was right. She put on her new coat and went to the nearest police station. Initially, no one paid attention to Michelle and her case. Kids are just playing around, can't you see? An overweight policeman with tired, reddened eyes told her, "These pranks are ridiculous. I've seen many pranksters in my time." But Michelle was persistent. She knew that she was the man's only hope. The person who wrote the secret message was relying on her. 
only Michelle could save him from his captivity. She needed to act fast. She didn't know how long the note had been in her coat. It could already be too late. But she refused to entertain that thought. Finally, a young officer agreed to take Michelle's statement. Ben, what a fool you are, taking on unnecessary problems. His older colleagues scolded him. But the man listened to Michelle, recorded her statement, took her note, and personally escorted her out, promising to keep her updated. Michelle repeatedly asked Ben if he was merely trying to dismiss an intrusive visitor, but he reassured her that everything would be handled appropriately, leaving her with no choice but to trust him. She had done all she could. Now it was up to the law enforcement officials. Only four days after Michelle's visit, the same operative called her for a meeting. She had to take a day off work, a luxury she could scarcely afford. Thanks to you, a significant case has been solved. Ben greeted Michelle with a friendly smile. Have you heard about Pamela McKechnie? Michelle nodded. Everyone knew about Pamela McKechnie. Her father was a notable figure in town, co-owner of the major metallurgical plant and a deputy. Wealthy, famous, influential. His daughter Pamela had disappeared three months prior. Despite having a driver and a security guard, the 16-year-old girl, who was studying at a prestigious language school, vanished on her way from school to her car. No one understood how that could happen. There were numerous theories. Many thought that Mr. McKechnie's rivals decided to manipulate him through his daughter with a carefully planned kidnapping. However, if she were kidnapped for ransom or coercion, the culprits would have already given their demands to the distressed father. Yet they remained silent. Another theory was that Pamela ran away. The child sought freedom from her influential father, overbearing mother, bodyguards, chauffeurs and endless routines. This version, which seemed the most romantic, was avidly discussed on social media because it was reminiscent of a TV series or movie. Despite extensive searching, Mr. McKinchney could not find any trace of Pamela. In desperation, he posted citywide ads promising large rewards for any information about his daughter. So, was it Pamela who wrote that note in my coat? She asked. The investigator nodded, his smile broadening. We saved the girl just in time. She's alive and well. She's in the hospital, suffering from exhaustion and a nervous breakdown. But her father will provide excellent rehabilitation, and she'll be back to her old self in no time. There are some papers for you to sign. Your statement played a crucial role in saving the girl. Michelle felt goosebumps on her back. Wow, if I hadn't bought that coat and met a gypsy on the way... A gypsy? She deserves gratitude too. Without her words, who knows when I would have discovered the note under the lining. Maybe I wouldn't have found it at all. Or I might have washed the coat, making the text unreadable. Michelle decided to ponder this thought later. Right now, she was more interested in the details of the rescue. What happened to Pamela? Why did she disappear? That's a story, said the investigator, pulling a pack of cigarettes from his pocket. He looked at Michelle and asked, Do you mind? Michelle shook her head. It seemed the conversation would be a long one. But she wasn't in a rush. She had taken the whole day off. The investigator began to speak in a smooth, measured tone, revealing himself to be an excellent storyteller. From early childhood, young Pamela McKechnie was used to having her every wish immediately fulfilled. Want an expensive toy? No problem. A dress from a famous designer? Right away. Recording a music video in a real studio? Also possible. The only thing missing for Pamela was freedom. Her days were scheduled down to the minute, lessons and extracurricular activities. And Pamela was already a grown-up girl. She wanted love, friendship, freedom. She wanted to know better the world beyond the fence of the mansion. It beckoned so much, seemed so interesting, full of adventures and bright events. One day, Pamela ran away. She evaded her vigilant guards and driver after school, 
leaving behind the confines of her private school. She roamed the city, visiting cafes, interacting with locals, and even dancing with street musicians in an underpass. She felt incredibly happy and free. It was a wonderful day, and everyone around her seemed kind, friendly, and genuine. Her father's words, that a man is a wolf to man, seemed forced to her. She even felt she understood life better than her influential father, who, despite his maturity and seriousness, seemed to have misconceptions about the world. Then, Pamela met a guy. He was tall, handsome, charming, and modest, a stark contrast to the arrogant and self-loving boys she usually interacted with at school. The stranger, who introduced himself as Tom, complimented Pamela in a way that left her head spinning. He carried a large backpack as he made his living selling second-hand items at the market. Pamela offered to help him. During the street vending, Tom shared his outstanding life story. He grew up in an orphanage, without parents, enduring many hardships throughout his childhood and teenage years. Pamela listened to his harrowing tales of poverty, street fights, and attempts to find his parents. In the evening, Pamela agreed to go with Tom to his apartment, located in an old house on the city outskirts. She already considered him a close friend. Tom, with his masterful charm, had won her trust. Without any apprehension, she got into his old, rusty car. While driving, Tom offered her some water, which she gladly accepted. However, after a few sips, her world began to spin. Pamela clung to Tom's sleeve to prevent herself from falling, feeling a rush of nausea. Then, everything went dark. Her memories returned in fragments. She recalled waking in the car as it veered onto a country road at a sign 153 kilometres. Then, having stopped the car, Tom pulled out the exhausted, immobilised Pamela and carried her on his shoulder into the house. Pamela noticed that the house stood on the edge of a long village street. When she fully regained consciousness, she found herself in a basement. It was dark and damp, yet equipped with necessities. A bed, a bucket toilet, and a table with a sewing machine. Tom even taught her how to operate it. He was a formidable, physically strong person. Pamela tried to escape a few times, but was easily overpowered and beaten by him. She realised that Tom was not even using his full strength. Over time, she understood it was best not to resist. If she complied, he did not harm her. Every day, he brought her meals. In the evenings, he asked her to read him fairy tales, which was both strange and frightening. This grown man would listen to magic stories from a thick book, his mouth agape in wonder. Tom taught Pamela to mend worn-out items, which he would then sell at the market. In this work, Pamela found her key to survival. The girl proved herself quite resourceful. The policeman smiled, taking a puff from his second cigarette. She hid notes in various concealed parts of her clothing, sewing them into the lining and buttonholes. If it weren't for her quick thinking, she'd still be trapped in the basement, or worse. It appears that Pamela wasn't the first captive of this basement. Tom lured girls, made them read him fairy tales, and repaired clothes, which he sold later. Tom fed his captives, relishing his control over them. Once he got bored with his current captive, he would dispose of them and find a new one. What a horror, Nichelle whispered. She couldn't begin to fathom the terror Pamela must have felt, alone in the basement with such a monster. Now you understand the danger of the man you had stopped, the investigator said seriously. You've done a great service to the world, not just to Pamela. You could have ignored the note, thrown it away and moved on. Or you could have given up when the police station didn't believe you. I know they didn't want to pay attention to your words. It's frightening to imagine if you had given up and left. Michelle nodded and shivered, feeling deeply unsettled by the existence of people like Tom. It was chilling to think that you never know who might be passing by, an average person or a monster. 
Pamela's father is Mr. McKechnie. He found out about you and wants to meet you, the investigator said. For what reason? Michelle questioned, suddenly excited. I think he wants to thank you, the investigator replied. And don't you dare be shy or decline. You deserve it. It turned out that currently Mr. McKechnie was at the station. He had documents to sign and people to talk to. Michelle recognised him immediately when he entered the office. After all, she had seen him numerous times in photos and videos. Now she was seeing him in person. Mr. McKechnie walked up to Michelle silently and embraced her in a surprised fatherly hug. This influential important man appeared so down-to-earth and genuine. Initially, Mr. McKechnie spoke about his state of mind during the months his daughter was missing. It was clear he needed to express his emotions. Michelle listened, showing empathy, nodding her head. Then it was Michelle's turn to speak. She told Mr. McKechnie about her financial troubles, her second-hand coat and the gypsy woman. Initially, she was unsure about sharing such details, fearing he wouldn't believe her and would think she was crazy. But he believed her. He believed in the gypsy and her prophetic clue. He also believed that his daughter's rescue was due to something inexplicable, incomprehensible. In a word, a miracle. You are a good, kind, decent girl, Mr. McKechnie finally said, as their conversation was drawing to a close. The most important thing is that you are not indifferent. Your case has saved not only my Pamela, but many other girls who might have been after her. I'm sure of it. I, of course, I'll thank you. You won't be in need any more. The gypsy girl was right about that too. I'll pay off your loan debt today and transfer the money to you. Of course, my gratitude can't be measured in money, but I'm pleased to think that I've helped you in some way. Mr. McKechnie kept his promise. An hour later, Michelle received a text message from her bank. She couldn't believe her eyes when she saw the amount on the screen. She was not yet used to such wealth. Michelle's life changed dramatically after becoming wealthy. She resigned from her supermarket job and searched for a new one, taking her time. She was no longer driven by poverty. She found a good job which was remote and well paid. Ironically, she started earning well when she didn't need money. Michelle was finally able to afford her long-time dreams. She got her driving license, bought a car, and purchased beautiful dresses. She even considered buying an apartment. She could afford any property in the city, but she wasn't sure she wanted to stay here. Once, she thought wealth was a guarantee of a carefree life, but she discovered that wealth was also a test. After becoming rich, Michelle was disappointed in people, especially those closest to her. Darcy was the first to distinguish herself. After leaving the police station, Michelle immediately shared her extraordinary experience with her, and soon her attitude towards Michelle changed. Darcy became more attentive, caring and polite. She frequently complimented Michelle, a stark contrast to her previous habit of teasing Michelle's appearance and behaviour. It irritated Michelle to realise that Darcy was flattering her, that she was constantly belittling herself and elevating Michelle to make her feel like a queen. Now, each of their meetings followed the same script. Darcy ordered delicacies and expensive drinks, described her miserable life in vivid detail, and hinted at her friend solving one of her problems. And Michelle, being now the wealthier one, always ended up paying the bill. And then Darcy presumptuously requested a golden jewellery set from a renowned brand as a New Year's gift. And Michelle finally realised that Darcy had always used her, and their friendship was based on doing Darcy favours. She had provided her with an apartment, written her term papers, and often babysat her child. However, when Michelle needed help to cover a debt, Darcy refused. She could have delayed her new car purchase to lend Michelle the money, but she chose not to. Looking at their friendship from a new angle, Michelle finally ended it. However, despite her wealth and a good job, she was not happy. The novelty of her affluent lifestyle 
had worn off, and she yearned for the company of close people who were now absent in her life. However, the second part of the prophecy gave her hope. It promised that a man who was already looking for her would bring her happiness, love, marriage, and even children. Eager to find this man, Michelle started dating. She engaged in a long romance with Keith, a man she met online, who seemed sensitive and understanding. He appeared to anticipate Michelle's thoughts and desires. But later, Michelle discovered that Keith was a graduate of a school that trained men to communicate effectively with wealthy women to achieve their goals. Michelle was aware of such schools for women, but for men? She was certainly not prepared for that. Michelle paid off Keith's loan and offered to help him, not realising that she was being skillfully led and pushed towards this decision. For New Year, she gifted him a motorcycle, fulfilling his dream of speed, wind in his ears and the roar of the engine. Eager to make her loved one happy, she also provided him with some money to develop his business. After all, it's important for a man to feel like a provider. Michelle was thrilled that her beloved would now engage in meaningful work and find his purpose. However, the business venture failed and the money vanished. Michelle consoled the disheartened Keith, urging him not to be upset. Yeah, Keith really turned out to be a worthy student. He managed to masterfully mess with his girlfriend's mind. The relationship proved costly for Michelle, with the money from Mr. McKechnie evaporating like snow under the March sun. But soon Michelle was able to look at Keith without rose-coloured glasses, and she was helped in this by one of her new colleagues. Michelle often showed pictures of Keith and told a lot about him. The entire office was familiar with Michelle's boyfriend, despite never meeting him. One Monday, Meg said, I saw your handsome boyfriend at the club on Saturday. No, it can't be, Michelle replied. Keith visited his mother yesterday. She lives in a neighbouring town and hasn't been feeling well, so he... I can tell that he has a spectacular mother, Meg said, grinning as she handed her smartphone to Michelle. On the screen was an intriguing photo. A passionate couple were caught in the dim light of a club. Keith, stylishly handsome, was pressing a striking brunette against him. It was far from a friendly embrace. Michelle stared at the couple, desperate to find evidence that the man was not Keith but a look-alike. However, it was indeed Keith in the photo that Meg had taken. He was wearing the expensive, stylish brand-name shirt Michelle herself had given him. Michelle did not begin to clarify the relationship with her partner the same evening. No, she did not want to spoil the illusion of a warm relationship, so she delayed until the last minute. However, she began to scrutinise Keith more closely, noticing details she previously overlooked. The truth about her beloved eventually emerged. Keith was a professional womaniser, living off the generosity of women. Before Michelle, he had been involved with a sixty-year-old widow of a renowned businessman. He held no moral values, love or feelings. Facing the harsh reality was challenging. Michelle felt used and insignificant again. Keith was only with her for the money. It seemed that Michelle herself meant nothing. Only Mr. McKechnie's money made her attractive to both her girlfriends and men. Michelle summoned the strength and ejected Keith from her life. Although it brought some relief, oppressive thoughts still haunted her. She could no longer trust people. Her best friend was greed-ridden and materialistic. Her supposed soulmate was merely a gigolo. Everyone seemed to want only her money. It was as though Michelle herself had no existence. She was nothing. Eventually, the woman came to what she believed was a splendid decision. She would leave the city. After all, what is holding her here? Her job was remote. She could visit the office twice a week, on Mondays to collect documents, and on Fridays to submit processed paperwork. That was more than sufficient. Michelle decided to live in the house where she grew up, where she had been happy, where she belonged, and where she would find happiness again. Michelle felt the need to take a break from life, to be alone with her thoughts. She believed a slower pace, silence, and a lack of rush 
would help her find balance and peace of mind. Now, Michelle is sitting on her suitcases and boxes waiting for a truck. She's leaving the apartment she rented for many years. She moved in as a naive student, full of plans for a bright future. Now she's leaving as what? A successful woman? Or an unhappy, lonely, disillusioned person? Michelle couldn't answer this question. Her parents' house greeted her with closed shutters and a heavy silence. It had been a long time since her last visit, and she missed it. She looked at the cobweb-laden corners, recalling how clean and cosy it was when her mother was alive. It was sad to see the house quiet, deserted, unattended. Michelle stood up, picked up a broom, and went into the hallway. She decided to start cleaning there, and the process warmed her soul. As Michelle wiped the dust off the shelves, she realized that she would never sell this place, not for all the money in the world. Over the course of the day, several neighbors, all long-time residents, visited Michelle. One of them was Mrs. Bison. Michelle, it's you, isn't it? Hello, darling, it's been a long time, Mrs. Bison greeted. Yes, it's me, Michelle smiled at her neighbor, pleased to see a familiar face from her past. You're not thinking of selling your parents' house, are you? I see you're cleaning up. No, I'm planning to live here. Really? Mrs. Bison exclaimed in surprise. I can't believe it. I heard you had a good job. Did you get fired? No, I still have my job. I'll be working from home remotely. It's something a lot of people do nowadays. Oh, I know that, Mrs. Bison said knowledgeably. Many people work remotely now. But young people are better off in the city. There are so many opportunities. Few people come back. And you? What happened? Everything is all right. I just wanted to go home, Michelle answered sincerely. Well, of course, take a rest. Home is the best place to be. I'll bring you lunch. Or you can come to us. I can see you'll be busy cleaning and won't have time to cook. Thank you very much, Michelle smiled warmly touched by the care she received. Gradually, Michelle adjusted to her new rural life. On Mondays, she travelled into the city to collect paperwork, processed it throughout the week, and returned it by Friday evening. Her schedule was relaxed and consistent. Typically, she completed the planned paperwork by midday, leaving her afternoons free for gardening. Michelle enjoyed working with the soil, caring for the flower beds, growing beautiful flowers, and decorating her garden with lanterns, gnome, and frog figurines. And Michelle also read, sitting on the porch in a big soft armchair, which she herself had brought here from the living room. She had never had time to do that before. Now she had time, and she was eager to make up for lost time. She was reading one book after another, and even bad weather was not an obstacle to reading in the fresh air. If it became cold, Michelle simply dressed warmer, and wrapped in a plaid. If it rained, she was still hidden by an awning from the rain, and enjoyed reading and the clatter of drops on the brightly coloured floor. One day, close to evening, Michelle was working in the vegetable garden. It was the very beginning of fall, Michelle's favourite time of the year. The intense heat had subsided, yet the first frosts were still a long way off. Nature was bursting with vibrant colours, and the air carried the scent of wild flowers. Evenings were becoming crisp, so Michelle wore her mother's warm sweater. Her hair was tousled, and she wore old boots on her feet. After all, she was heading to the vegetable garden, not a fashion show. Living in the countryside offered the benefit of not needing to style her hair, apply makeup, or look perfect. However, that evening, Michelle wished she had dressed a bit more appropriately. Michelle, is that you? A pleasant, male voice unexpectedly called from behind the fence. Michelle's mind had been wandering, as it often did recently, but she turned around quickly and met the gaze of the man she had idealised throughout her childhood and adolescence. Although he wasn't a man back then, he was a child. In front of Michelle stood Brian, the person whom all the neighbours used as a positive example for their children. He was grown up, tanned and smiling. Michelle recognised him instantly, 
despite not having seen him for over ten years. How could she forget someone who had dominated her dreams for so long? Michelle vividly remembered how her heart would pound at the sight of his bright blue t-shirt in the distance. Brian was almost like a dream to her back then, handsome, intelligent, and incredibly self-assured. He was never at a loss for words, and always knew what to say and to whom. After high school, Brian moved to the capital to study at a university and became a paediatric surgeon. At least, that's what the neighbours said. Brian never returned here. Instead, his parents moved to their son to the capital themselves. It was said that Brian bought an apartment for them, close to his own. How lucky they are, the neighbours would say. What a fine son they've raised. Respected, wealthy, a doctor, and considerate of his elders. This Brian should be in the capital now, leading the busy life of a successful man. So how had he ended up here, in near her fence? Of all people, Brian was the last person Michelle expected to see here. It was astonishing, like a dream come true. Hi, Michelle managed to smile, hoping no dirt was on her face, a common mishap for her. You haven't changed much, Brian commented as he approached the fence. Why are you here? I heard about your parents, I'm sorry. Yes, my parents are gone, Michelle confirmed. I understand. I often dream of escaping to a deserted island. But my parents need me. That's the only thing holding me back. You're a surgeon, I hear. A paediatric cardiac surgeon, Brian clarified. Michelle found herself looking at his fingers, the slender, long fingers. No one would believe that Brian grew up in the village, and these very hands chopped wood and milked a cow and carried heavy weights. And I work as a manager. I work remotely, which allows me to live here. How do you like it? Are you content with this life? Brian looked intently into Michelle's eyes, compelling her to tell the truth. Well, of course, I like everything. Listen, why are we standing here? Why don't you come in, if you're not in a hurry? Or sit on the patio. I'll make you tea with raspberry leaves. I remember you used to like that when you were a kid. I still do, I guess, smiled Brian. I haven't drunk it for a long time, though, and I've forgotten the taste, I think. They sat on the patio under the rapidly darkening sky. Michelle switched on a lantern, and in its light the gnats and moths danced their eternal dances. Large and bright stars lit up one after another in the sky, the kind you can only see in the countryside. Michelle wanted this moment to last as long as possible, with Brian sitting next to her, speaking in his lulling, pleasant voice. He was so... special. Michelle hadn't realised her childhood feelings were still alive. Maybe her relationships with other men didn't work out, because she unconsciously compared them with Brian. Brian exuded warmth and acceptance, which Michelle could physically feel. She sensed that he, too, was pleased to sit with her and talk as if no long years of separation had occurred. You know, Brian suddenly confessed, of everyone in the village, I found you the most interesting to talk to. You were always so thoughtful and understanding. That's very nice to hear, Michelle sincerely responded. Brian began to talk about his life. He resided in the city, devoting most of his time to work, teaching students and studying. He was constantly learning new things, honing his skills, and practising with experienced professors and surgeons. Brian excelled in handling the most challenging cases and sought out such patients, enjoying the difficult tasks. When Brian spoke about his work, his eyes sparkled. Michelle smiled. It was clear that he loved his job. Brian had found his path, his place in life. He came to the village because his parents asked him to take some things from the house. How about you? Tell me about yourself. There's not much to tell, really, shrugged Michelle. In comparison to Brian's life, her own seemed somewhat grey, uninteresting, almost meaningless. I lived and worked in the city, and I'm tired, so I came here to rest and rejuvenate. 
you're home alone? So, you don't have a husband and children? Brian asked, immediately becoming embarrassed. Oh, I'm sorry, that was a tactless question. No, it wasn't, Michelle smiled. She was pleased that Brian showed interest in her personal life. You're right, I don't have children or a husband. I'm alone. Brian smiled understandingly. I'm also alone. I recently ended a strange and difficult relationship, but I don't feel lonely. I feel free, even liberated. This confession pleased Michelle. She even had to avert her eyes, so that Brian would not notice the impression his words made on her. Michelle remembered a prophecy that soon she would meet her true love. Her heart told her that this time there would be no disappointment. Everything would finally be right, good, and as it should be.